we're very far apart from each other physically, but it's I'm I'm very happy to be able to do this and and talk to you about uh, your book, which I have told you before, but it's true. I really loved it. Um, it's obviously very um, thought provoking. Uh, it, yeah, but it's also for me, it was very uh, emotionally resonant personally. And I was really, really impressed with how you it's it's kind of has an epic scope. It has such a broad epic scope. And yet it's very precise and focused on on human relationships at the same time. So the way you navigated were able to do that was was very impressive to me as well, like as as a writer in terms of, of structure and the structure you were able to come up with to tell the story. So I thought, could you describe the book to people who might not have read it? And then also, if you could read like a brief sample, that would be amazing as well. Thank okay. you. Thank yeah. you so much, lady. And and I love the talented Ripkins. I don't have your uh, new novel yet. So thank you so much. Yeah. Um, it's a bit hard to describe it because I spent so much time inside of it. Um, and so now it, it it's but discombobulating to look at it from the from the other side of it. I understand. Um, yeah. But basically it's about it's about three three lives which are ostensibly unrelated. Uh, Beth a South African diplomat who's living in Shanghai, um, her neighbor that she becomes quite close friends with um, was a retired journalist. Um, so one would imagine that they have absolutely nothing in common, um, but there are so many intersections, or at least that's what I tried to write about. The mm. fact that what actually binds the two of them is the fact that they have this very human need for, for elemental freedoms, um, not just freedom of speech, but, but that is one of the things that I look at because they living inside of China, which is pretty much a surveillance state. Um, the South African diplomat, Death, Death, I'm sorry. I can hear myself in the background, so I want to turn that phone off. Excuse me. Um, oh, is there still an echo? Can you still hear? Right now, it's on my side. I'm sorry, I can hear myself speaking and thinking now very loudly. Um, so Beth, um, the South African diplomat, she grew up in a apartheid South Africa. Um, and so that was a surveillance state. So, you know, that they are very basic freedoms which connect them. Um, but also at that intersection is their love of Langston Hughes. Um, and so Langston Hughes makes quite, I, I think, uh, not, not a subtle appearance in the novel as well. So it's about these ostensibly unrelated lives, but they're actually very closely intertwined, not just on the, you know, on, on the fact that they are human beings um, desiring the same sort of freedoms, but also that the political processes that these are also interwoven, you know, um, because China influenced South Africa at some point um, in terms of the politics. Langston mm. Hughes played quite an important role in South Africa, um, at least in the writing community. So, yeah, uh, can, I'm going to just give me one second to turn this off. <laughs> and yeah, I'm so no, sorry. Please, please. Give me one second. Of course. Welcome to look at my um, very untidy office. I will say that this is the only spot in my office. Ah, there we go. Much is better. That I, okay, good. Yeah, myself now. Thank you. That's good. That's good. Do you, could you read, uh, do you want to read a small yes. section? I have many, many questions for you. <laughs> okay. uh, lady, can I, can I read from the first chapter? Is that okay? Yes. Yes. Just of course. Uh, for, for anyone who doesn't have the book, it, there are no spoilers here. So, mm -hmm. so um, this is the South African copy I've got. The, the uh, US version and the British version looks uh, quite different. So, it starts in Shanghai, um, chapter one. The repetitive beat of typewriter keys always amplified at around 1 a.m. because this was the time when life on the street below stalled. Shanghai never became truly quiet. Only in the slip of time between midnight and 4 a.m. did the traffic recede and the noise temporarily wane. All day long, the din of construction filled the air as cranes and gantries 
as common to the sky as birds and planes to other cities crisscrossed the gray. Bamboo scaffolding woven intricately, intricately as fine cotton gave shape to the vertical city, while beneath shift workers arrived all day long, the hum and thrust of metal always in the distance. In those months when I was new to the city and its unfathomable sounds, I knew this was the time, if any, that I would hear him typing. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah, that's that's great. That's really interesting. Um, no, I've read it several times, but I was just thinking about that that as the the opening um, for the book. Um, so I wanted to ask you, as a writer, um, if you could talk a little bit about what initially inspired you to write it, because it is so it's very intricate, the book. And there's a, it, you know, it makes reference. There's like three different contexts, political, social, cultural contexts that it's involved with, and they're integrated in a really particular way. And I was curious about where, sort of where did, where did it start? What was the impetus? What did you start with for writing it? Um, so, so I lived in Shanghai for three years. Um, so that was quite an interesting experience because I actually arrived there with a baby, a small oh, human wow. baby wow. that I'd given birth to in the USA. And then we made our way to Shanghai. So um, I was quite isolated. I was in a new country. Um, I did not know the language, so I was quite isolated. Um, so, you know, I mean, and I'm sure with, with many, not just writers, but people who love books, who love to read, the way you experience the world is mm. also through mm. fiction, you know? So in this case, it wasn't just about me reading fiction, uh, but also I didn't have access to the kind of fiction I wanted, just, just about what I said earlier about China being, you know, a kind of a surveillance state. But so to access Shanghai imaginatively, I wrote kind of, what I thought might, I, I kind of, I, I accessed it through my own fiction, if that makes sense, uh -huh. because I was very isolated. I was limited to an expat community, um, expat community, you know, I mean, mostly a community of foreigners, but of course, not always. There were many interactions with Chinese, with Chinese people, but the scope, my scope was limited to an international community almost. So I wanted to look at what was beneath that or what was around the corner from that. So that that was my, it was kind of a quest. I wanted to know Shanghai from a different perspective than the one that I'd been, you know, to the, to the access that I was limited to. And I was limited, you know, for a couple of reasons. You know, my, the fact that I was a, a new mother was one of those things. So that was kind of the, the, the kernel. Mm -hmm. um, and then when, when we left China and moved back to South Africa, moved back to Cape Town, I missed it so much. I missed Shanghai. I missed um, the people that I'd gotten to know and love. Um, and so I think as with my first novel, it was kind of a love letter to, to Shanghai. Um, and so, yeah, so so some, someone said to me um, two weeks ago that they thought, they didn't choose the words anti-Chinese, but that was kind of, where they were going. And I was like, no, 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 I, I love China. I love the China, I love I loved the entire experience. Um, and I wrote this novel as a love letter to the, my, my Chinese friends and to the place that I've left. Um, but I am critical. I'm critical of South Africa as well. And I love, I, I live here, so yeah. Right, right. Well, no, that that's interesting that um, I, I didn't get that at all. It, it, it seemed kind of like a, a homage to, and I can't remember his name, but then I, because of course I'm, I'm a fairly educated person, but there were all kinds of things I had to look up, which I was very happy to do. I might add, it was not that hard and, and I was very happy to do that. But the, um, I saw the, the book Tombstone. So, and in a way I was, I, I it really felt like um, cause I read, I read your novel first and then I was reading about that book as well. It's sort of a, a, a homage to the author of that book in a sense, also to, to Langston Hughes, which I found really interesting, um, as well. So no, I, I, yeah, that's interesting. I, I thought that was really lovely. Did you, did you start writing it 
prior to that book being published or how long ago did you start writing the this novel um gosh some time ago i, yeah. I think it it took so long i mean the the writing of the novel took a couple of years but getting it into public i mean that publishing it took a long time right. so i i started writing it ugh, probably like 9 years ago um you know 8 years ago that i started like properly formally sitting down and working you know towards a finished right. product um but yeah just just on young jishang's book tombstone um yeah. So the interesting thing was that, and perhaps it's happened to you when you start something, when you start a work of fiction, or maybe maybe it's an academic paper, you just find these incredible fortuitous events. You know, there's just you read something that opens a door to something else, which opens a window, and you just keep walking through. Um, and I was very led by that process. But just when when I was, I spent two days in Hong Kong when we were living in 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 Shanghai, and in the, I think it was called the South China Morning Post. Um, it's an English language newspaper. There was a review of oh. Tombstone by Yang oh, Jiusheng. So it, it came out while you were in Shanghai. Yes. Oh, wow. But the only reason I came across that review was because I was in Hong Kong that weekend, because that, that book would not have been publicized or it would have, wouldn't have been in a language that I maybe had access to when I was in Shanghai. So there was kind of this neat little uh, window where I saw the review and where that just struck me. I mean, I remember sitting, I was in a hotel. I remember sitting with that newspaper and you know, you just know there's something really important about this article. And so that was one of the, the early sort of, um, uh, I hate using the word inspiration, but it, it, okay. it left a mark on me. And um, I can't remember when I went to go and look up Tombstone, um, but it must have been when when I was back home in South Africa, perhaps on a vacation or perhaps when we'd moved back home. But from the time that I read about the book to the time that I actually um, read Tombstone, there were there were a few years in between, you know, so that was just that was a, that was exciting. And then, you know, similarly with Langston Hughes, there were other kinds of um, just really interesting there was lots of serendipity as well. Um, because, yeah. yeah. Oh no, go ahead, go ahead, I'm sorry. No, no, it, it, it was, I was trying to, I wanted to talk about race because uh, having grown up in South Africa, it, it's, it's, I guess it's what, what we do, <laughs> what I do. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I'm always, I'm always looking at things from that perspective because I'm a woman of color in the world so I was in China and so I wanted to kind of reflect on that um, but I wanted it to be a very nuanced understanding of race um, and so when I found out that Langston Hughes had spent some time in China um, and that he'd had you know these wonderful relationships with, with Chinese writers that was a big moment so then I knew that I needed to, you know, find out more about Langston Hughes. And because of that, I ended up finding out that he'd, he'd um, kept correspondence with many South African writers, many wow. African writers right. for many years. I, that's what I was going to ask you about, because I was curious about that, I, like how much you knew about him. So again, the connection originally with Langston Hughes was through China because yes. I found all of that fascinating. So I didn't know like how much of it you knew about, you know, sort of the, the breadth of his influence and, and the, do you know what I mean? Like I was really struck no. by that. Yeah. yeah. And I know, I know I, I didn't. Yeah. That's amazing. Well, there you go. There's a, there's another one. That's pretty amazing. But um, I, I love the way you said the breadth of his influence because he was so influential, not just as a writer, but certainly as a writer, but just also, I mean, his politics, um, right. and what he may or may not have been doing, you know, he, he traveled extensively in the 1930s to the 1940s. I think he traveled his whole life. Um, so he was just, a, he was an, a very interesting human being. Um, yeah. So and, you, and I only you, learned about it when I was doing research. So that's, I didn't see that's amazing because it's such a central, um, it's almost like a lynch, it is a linchpin, but it's also an emo, it has so much emotional 
resonance again, like his example and the role it plays, like his voice in the book. It's for me as a reader, I'm, I'm speaking, I, I, you realize that, but for me, I was like, this is, and it was fascinating. And um, I wondered where sort of the, the, that's a part of what I was asking about. What was the sort of the initiation, the initiating pull towards including Langston Hughes as like a central character like that he, you hear his voice and stuff like that and the decision to inhabit his voice so that's really fascinating so when you first heard about him or thought about him it was in relation to China without realizing that he had uh put together the oh do you want to maybe you should could you tell people a little bit about Langston Hughes and how his role in the book so just so they know what we're yeah. talking about so. um so, so Langston Hughes um, in the in in my novel, so they're fictional letters that he uh, wrote to a South African, a Cape Townian writer. So from my city, Cape Town, um, but that's based kind of on on a lot of what he did. He he wrote letters. I mean, I was thinking of one particular writer from my city because he taught at my high school mm. decades before I went there. So you know, there were all these little. Um, little connections, um, which were just so surprising and so interesting. I mean, this was the 1950s, you know, so, and Langston Hughes had reached out to um, South African writers and African writers. And he, in fact, published two books. Um, and I've got them here somewhere. Uh, it was an African treasury in 1960. And there was another one in 1964. Um, I can't find the name right now. But so he actually published two. Uh, one was a book of short stories. I mean, it wasn't just short stories. It was poems. It was um, opinion, uh, op-eds, you know, it, it was um, opinion pieces. But he actively sought out African writers with the precise intention of publishing them internationally. Mm. So, you know, I mean, that's also such an extraordinary thing to do. Why do it when he yeah. could have focused on you know, the US, which which he did. He just had so much to give. And and um, subsequent to, to that, I, I'm now following people on Twitter, um, um, academics yeah. around the world who had, you know, who are also now speaking about the kind of connection that Langston Hughes had with um, places where they're from, um, you know, wow. in, in Eastern Europe. So wow. his influence was so wide ranging. So the more you learn about a man like Langston used it, it. It kind of it was very hard not to write about it. Right. And then just right. just the the you know the, I mean I was very conscious of what I was doing and and um, what I had the right to do. Um, and so I was very respectful. I I tried very hard to do that. I tried to be you know do a lot of research because it it's it's not a small thing to want to write in the voice of one of the. You know, I know. Most important. So I, I try to be very conscious. And, and other writer friends, they they said to me, "You need to be very careful. You shouldn't. You know, right. you you need to think carefully about it." So, which is also why I kind of chose the second person. It was just a little way of me saying, "I'm not trying to inhabit. You know, right? I'm not trying to speak from his voice, but I kind of wanna when I, so I looked at, he, I mean, he was an epic letter writer. Langston used just I've got books of letters that he wrote to so many people. And there is one just, in fact, there are two books um, of letters that he wrote. One to South African female author who lived in Botswana. Her name was Bessie Head. I didn't know that. See, this is what I'm yes. talking about. You, you made me look stuff up. And then I was so yeah. glad that I did. Um, Thank you. So not to not to interrupt, but but no, because I I it was it was it was pretty interesting because I sort of had a vague, you know, I knew sort of about him, but I don't think I think you, the novel was an opportunity to really reflect on the significance of that and how striking it is what he did. Do you know what I mean? Like as yes. an, as an American writer to have forged all of these and so. I appreciate that. And I know uh, there, there's a subtext for me again in here about writing and, and empathy. You were talking about that maybe. I, I think you were talking about that. I find that, and so that was really interesting. And I also was thinking because um, I was very impressed 
there are several voices that talk and Langston Hughes is one of them. And I was like, oh, this is, you, you do all of them very, very well. I was very impressed with his Thank voice. You. And I was, I was Thank thinking- so much. Yeah, about the research that must have gone into. And I understand that, that you're saying it, it probably was a bit intimidating to inhabit oh, these. Yeah. <laughs> No, I mean, I, I, I took months. I took, no, I, I probably took a year to to decide how I would approach them. And and I kept on going, no, 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 you can't write from Langston Hughes' perspective. I know mm -hmm. that I kind of do, but, you know, it's the second person. And it feels like a safe distance. Um, but it was very difficult. And I didn't know, you know, what the best approach was. And then I started coming across these letters. And then I was like, okay, this is it. This, it has to be this medium so that I can, you know, try and be respectful. Um, but also, you know, we, we're in an era where cultural appropriation is something that we speak about and we think about it. And we and um, I was speaking to some some students at the university that I went to. Um, and, you know, having grown up in South Africa as a um, literally a second or third class South African because I grew up. Uh, under apartheid, uh, you we, you know, there was always um, writers or artists interpreting, um, you know, writing about my communities, and I, I'm purposely saying my communities because I don't want to limit myself to you know one identity, but writing about us um, where we could not. So I'm very conscious of cultural appropriation. On the other hand, I'm also a writer and I have to, I have to, you know, inhabit someone else. I have to kind of, you know, walk in someone else's shoes. I have to, so, so there's, for me, it was the act of bridging between having been written about in derogatory ways and then, you know, trying to find the access to also, I mean, I write from a Chinese man's perspective. Right, um, right. Yes, you know, and you don't want to be uh, what do you, what do Americans say beating down? You know, you have so you have to be conscious of what you're doing, um, and so yeah, so so there's kind of this bridge between my my belief that a writer must inhabit other um, imaginations or, or experiences right. and freedom of speech, but also being conscious of the fact that I grew up being mocked and you know derided. Um, through literature and through theater and through music um, because of, you know, where I'm from. Right. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it, so I was very cautious uh, and the research helped with that. You, I feel like you can, um, because it is, it's a precarious thing and I think it is important though, but part of what I'm, I'm, I, there, I have so many questions for you and I'm, I'm trying to, like pare it down because like, we don't have that much time. But um, so part of what I was saying about how I appreciated um, the doing the research was that uh, you're right, a certain, it, you you do feel a different connection to people when it's fiction and, and the voice is inhabited in that way. So that's part of what I'm saying, like I needed to think about his voice in order to really think about what he had done. Do you see what I mean? Like, so that was like, cause I've read, you know, I've read about, I knew about it, but I didn't feel it in the same way. And I, well, I that's the that's, best compliment. I think I'm about to, or, or I've just heard that. That means a lot to me because that's how I accessed fiction my yeah, whole life. Yeah. That's, but I, that's and the I, point of fiction. Yeah. Yes. And I, because I was thinking about that at times when I was reading the book, because there are so many different voices and um, and I was thinking about oh, inhabiting different ways. They all sounded different. They felt different to me, but it caused me to reflect on my knowledge of voices. A lot of that is actually from literature as well. Do you know what I mean? So, yeah. which is very interesting to think about in terms mm -hmm. of both sides of what you're saying. It's a very complicated topic, but I, I was, I, it just made me very aware of that. Do you know what I mean? In a way that, um, yeah, that I appreciated. And I appreciated what a difficult gesture it was. And I thought it was handled very um, respectfully. And so I, I, and I know it's a, uh, it's, it's a, you, you, you're taking a risk. You can feel that I'm sure. And it, or you should. Yeah. It's, 
probably a good sign if you're if you can feel that you're do you know what I mean like as opposed I, I to I felt so nervous I felt so nervous because I did feel like I, it, it wasn't a comfort zone just, but just interestingly on the well, not interesting for me on the voices and I don't know if you can hear my dog in the background so no 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 <laughs> so um I kind of wrote in character which was new for me you know so I did not um I, I wrote characters I wrote the whole of Beth I wrote the whole of Jao I wrote the whole of the Langston Hughes sections and then I kind of put them you know fitted them together and then went back and rewrote it because I needed to be in a certain space I needed to be in character so a lot I mean it sounds weird to say it because I'm I'm, you know there's no method for this I'm I'm not a performer maybe I'm anyway um but I I actually listened to I tried to listen to um, the audiobook of um, an, an actor reading Langston Hughes's memoir. Uh, I wonder as I wonder, um, mm. just to kind of get the flavor and the, and then and so then I could write those pieces. And then when I did the Chinese um, voice, a uh, Zhao's voice, I kind of read literature that kind of you know uh, gave China world and you know China for me. Um, and then I could write that, but I knew that I couldn't like write two characters at the same time because I just, I was, I was, yeah, I guess it was a method. <laughs> yeah, no, it's very interesting. So, and I, that's part of, that's another thing I wanted to ask because the structure is so specific too. And I was wondering about that, like, especially with the bath, the way she's bifurcated or yeah, in a sense. And then in, at the end, it, it sort of shifts. So I was wondering how that related to sort of the larger themes of the book, actually. Do you know what I mean? The the representation of Beth in that way, in terms of like tents and things like that. Can you say so, so, that? Or? Yeah, I mean, in, in terms of tents, because I wrote in the first person and then in the person. third person. Yes, yeah, that's what I meant. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I guess just because, you know, it, I suppose we all, you know, we, we look back, we kind of, you know, use a telescopic lens to look back at our younger selves. Um, and she, you know, the, the, the contemporary Beth that we encounter in the novel at first is very different, as we all are, to the teenager that she kind of is reflecting upon at some points. Um, and so it felt to me like it needed to be in two different tenses and maybe I, I probably was overthinking it but so the first um, it becomes the first starts in first person and and um, her younger self is written in third person but I guess I was also just trying to you know to and uh, I mean I, one of the um, I know I'm not supposed to read reviews but I have no. kind of read no. some of them <laughs> <laughs> and someone who reviewed it to that, you know, there was no reason for me to write in different tenses. But for me, the character is looking at a different character. You know, Beth is looking at someone else. She's right. not the same person. And that's kind of the whole point of the story. Yes. That she has to get back to accepting what she's um, consciously um, blocked from her memory, right. kind of. You know, right. She went through a trauma. She went through a massive trauma. Um right. Yeah, and so, so that I just actually, that, that made perfect sense to me. I have to okay, say, okay, thank you. Not, well, <laughs> no, because I, it, there, you know, the book is called "How to Be a, a Revolutionary." I should ask you about that as well. But in, in it, you know, it's reflected upon in multiple senses, and one is in terms of like personal transformations that these characters have to go through in terms of their sense of their own identities, right? Yeah. Which, in, it, to me, is in part what what that was speaking to that gesture do you know what I mean like yeah. turning around and stuff yes like that. yes so. yes I mean and 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 that 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 is that is it exactly I mean the I guess the titles also somewhat ironic because you know they are they fumble they all fumble they falter they fall um I'm thinking of another if we're you know they mess mm-hmm. up um at some point, and then they have to they have to find a way to get back to to being true to themselves. Right. Um, and I don't want to say revolutionary duty because I also don't want to you know uh, be twee about it. I don't want to I don't want to minimize what people who are in war situations go through. People are in revolutions, you know, right now 
as we right. speak, I, I don't want to minimize it because you are sometimes pushed into those positions and you have no choice. Right. But and 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 I think that is true for different points of the novel where, where they are forced into a revolutionary situation, not both a situation because they are fighting for their lives in some way. Um, but then there are also points where you consciously can decide to um, to try to change the world. I'm sorry, I'm saying it in a very basic way, but I was actually thinking about it the other day. And, I, you know, that's what it's about as well. You know, you kind of, especially when you're young, when you're a teenager, you want to change the world. You see, you see what's wrong. You see, you know, you you see where you can make a difference especially well okay I come from a different circumstance because you know we I was an oppressed um, person in South Africa um, so so you see what needs to happen and, and you see where you can fit into that um, yeah I can't remember what I was saying lady because my dog is sitting outside oh I'm sorry <laughs> no no it's just so fascinating um so because you have also you have K. And it's sort of like this, uh, and, and Beth really too, right? This idealized sort of youthful wanting to be a revolutionary, but then there's also the, the contrast with um, the, the, the manuscript, the, like the end of, not the end literally, but someone much older being moved to make this very revolutionary gesture for them and take this huge risk towards the end of their lives as well. So there was, for, that was very interesting to me also. So um, yeah, I, I started thinking about the difference between um, what you do because you start, it, it becomes, a part of it becomes really thinking about compromise and the things people do to survive and also betrayal. Um, you also have the contrast between like Hughes appearing before the house, an American yeah. commit, just the meaning of, of revolutionary, whether it's a, you know, a, a positive or a negative or whatever, there, there are all these contrasts because the, the contexts are also different. Um, and I think it, it, I, let me just, what is a revolutionary? What, what would you say is a revolutionary? As opposed to how to be one. <laughs> I do not think that I'm qualified to answer that question. Um, I, I, I guess what I was trying to do was, you know, to be ironic about it um, and, and not provide an answer. But, you know, when we've been discussing, um, when we've been discussing this exact topic, I guess, um, I, I, I don't know that I can answer it, but I think it, it's about um, being selfless. Uh, in, in many ways, yeah, of course, it's you know, it's a, it's about being a revolution. It's about wanting to to have a make a radical change in society, but it's also about finding your courage in a way. You know that 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 point where your um, your courage is equal to or greater than your fear. I think right. that moment, when one discovers that moment, that is a revolutionary moment, and when you act in the interests of um, people outside of yourself mm -hmm. and, and you try and actually make a change that does impact society I think that's a revolutionary act um, so as opposed to just a revolution excuse my dog again as opposed mm -hmm. to an actual revolution when, when you know and so, and so just just interestingly with with Langston use um, what I found fascinating again about him was that he went through I think after the house an American um, um, sessions or, 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 or the trials or whatever it's called, he did um, not choose the Fifth Amendment. So he actually, he, you know, he, he spoke. Um, and many people saw him as having betrayed. Um, I mean, what was happening at the time was that there was the, you know, it, it was a, it was the McCarthy, you know, yeah. which went, uh, and he chose to um, give testimony, and people felt betrayed by that. Um, and I tried to, you know, look at him in, in, in the fullness of his life um, and what it must have been like. And again, I wasn't trying to, you know, speak for him, but I wanted to understand what it must have been like to be a black gay man, if he was gay, I'm not assuming, um, and how hard it must have been to write um, for a living. And yeah. he had many struggles economically, you know, 
But then towards the end of his life, when I think he was reasonably stable, he reaches out to all these African authors and he's pulling them up, you know? So he's lifting, what is it, uh, to, to lift as you rise. Yeah, yeah. And so I just found this, you know, I found it extraordinary. And it was that kind of, that, that ethos, that beautiful gesture that I also found really revolutionary because I think he opened the door in many ways for African writing. I, I'm, not, I'm not saying he's the only one. That's not what I'm saying. But he did get authors published internationally. And they would not have been if he had not, um, you know, sought them out. Um, right. So, you know, yeah. That's beautiful. Long answer. <laughs> no, no, that's really beautiful. Um, okay. Well, I, we're almost out of time. I have a bunch more questions. One thing I wanted to ask you about in the book is the, the role of the witness witnessing and giving testimony and how that relates to the larger themes. I don't even know if we have time for you to answer that question, but I was, that was something like throughout, obviously it's a big issue is the idea of giving testimony. Um, yeah. yeah. It, it, it really was, you know, um, I did want to, to um, I mean, it, it's not just the act of giving testimony. It's the, it's the, or being called, it's, yeah. It's being called, but it's also having people um, seeing you um, and and uh, mm. creating a space for you to mm. to. I mean, I mean, you know, when when um, Beth needed as an example, and I won't. There won't be any spoilers, but she needed to speak on behalf of someone who couldn't speak on couldn't speak for themselves. Um, and that's also really, in a way, you know, a revolutionary duty because someone has to stand up and say, okay, well, you know, these people, or, or in this case, it, it was someone who, who had died. So it's not like she was speaking on behalf of, of Pete. She, she, right, she was speaking right. for a friend. Um, and so she, she needed to be witness. She needed to be witness to what her friend had gone through. And um, yeah, she, she needed to offer a testimony not just to to what her friend had done but to her existence so you know in a very so and I think that was one of the important things as well for me was another major theme was friendship um, yeah. and that's yeah. what we seek out when we seek friends as well you know when we have an intimate relationship with someone we want someone to witness you know our daily trials we want them to witness who we are on a very close level uh, right. you know on an intimate intimate level um, so there was that idea of friendship as well, um, which which I think is a major theme in the novel. It is, yeah. No, okay, I won't give anything away because I was going to say something, but I, I won't say it. But no, I was that was very striking me also because it's um it's interesting in terms of the perspective of mo most of the the characters are kind of witnesses. It's told it's kind of told from the perspective. I mean, things happen to them, obviously, which and they they always often do also happen to the witness. Do you know what I mean? I've just been thinking about that role a lot. And so I thought it was very fascinating, again, because there are these like huge sort of historic events that are talked about in the in the book, but it's it's from the perspective of the witness, do you know what I mean? And the witness is, yeah. has, has often suffered as well, right? But but really their primary role is in the book. And, uh, and, I, and, and I, you know, I think you can, um, I've been thinking a lot about that as um, ultimately like a very empowering perspective too, which I found very interesting. I don't know if I'm making sense, but it relates Your to- Your witness what, is powerful? Yes, yes. yes. To I give testimony, me. to feel called yes. to give testimony. Yes. That's I, not, I, to, I, not to, not to, yeah, no, that's what I mean. It's really about yeah, yeah, yeah. time. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that is definitely, you know, something that was very important to me as well. And I don't want to say that, but I also wanted to witness Langston Hughes, just by the way. I, I wanted to, from this perspective, he died in 1967, I think. So from, you know, how many decades I wanted to look back at him as well and, and I wanted to, to to kind of write about what he had done as well yes. for, for, for African writing um because I don't think it's acknowledged enough to be honest um don't either but, <laughs> sorry I just wanted to mention that um 
but yeah, I mean, I think the whole act of 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 testifying or um, you know witnessing someone else's life and being willing to um, to to stand up for them, uh, I th I think that that. I think that's not only the core of friendship. Mm -hmm. I think that is that is the core of revolutionary acts. So there's there's this word in um, in 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 South Af in African philosophy. It's called Ubuntu, mm -hmm. and so it's a it's a it's a core principle in African philosophy. And it means um, you are because of someone else. You are a person through other people. So I kind of found that really beautiful. And I guess there was that theme going through. The novel as well and I mean I said I wasn't going to answer it but for me that is something that a revolutionary would take heed of you know you are because of other people you are through other people and we're living in such bizarre we're not living in bizarre times yeah we are we are I mean I think the last couple of years has seen a dramatic escalation in um you know uh, uh, the globe has moved towards fascism in a way that I had not um, and again, I'm talking about witnessing from South Africa. Yeah, yeah. I had not seen that growing up, you know, the con or at least, but maybe that maybe that was a conceit of mine, but that, I, I didn't see, you know, being this age and seeing the right. kind of president that was installed in the US a few years ago, or seeing this very sharp a turn towards fascism in, in parts of Europe. So yeah, I mean, all of that is, I don't know why I'm telling you this, but no, <laughs> it's no, also being that. It makes perfect sense to me. And I, that's beautiful. I, I, I think that's really beautiful. That makes perfect sense to me, actually. I understand. So thank you. I loved your book. Thank you. Thank you thank so you. much. Thank you for the lovely questions, lady. Um, and that you did it so closely. It, it's, it's a great honor that you did. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yes, thank you both. Um, it's a great conversation. So we have a question from Anderson Tepper. He said, uh, you mentioned that there was a long path to publication. Was it published in South Africa first? And then what was the process in the UK and the US? And I wonder too, if you could just kind of tell us a little bit about what the publishing world is like in South Africa too. Um, I don't speak about that any longer because it makes me very upset. Um, no, okay, I will speak about it. So, you know, we, we don't have a massive industry. We have a very small industry, um, and I'm going to only be polite now, but we don't sell very many books, so it, it's a difficult process. I mean, you can't write as a living, but that was also, again, I'm going to speak about Langston Hughes. That was the, the humbling part of writing about this iconic um, writer who struggled so much. So, you know, it also could put things into perspective. You can't write for a living in South Africa. So, so you know, I have a full-time job here um, so that I can write. Don't tell my bosses that. Um, you know, so it, it's a small industry. It's um, it's quite an elite industry, I think you can say, because you can't write unless you have some access to money or access to time or a university job. So I feel like we've got a lot of work to do here. Um, having said that, I have been published here uh, because it's my second novel. Um, and because because I'm quite privileged, I'm a privileged South African. Um, and I don't say that with any kind of humility. That's just a fact. You know, right? I've got solar power, uh, you know. <laughs> yeah. the, a lot, big chunks of my city is sitting without electricity right now. I, I've got solar. Um, so um, there's that. Sorry, we do have electricity as well. If, if, if anyone didn't hear the beginning, we do have electricity. It's just they've been switching it off for a couple of hours a day just for a short period of time. Um, so th it's hard to get published in South Africa, but um, yeah, a few of us do get published. I was fortunate enough to find an incredible agent, um, Anjali Singh, and, you know, she was just, I mean, marvelous so so incredibly generous with her time and, and her advice and so we we worked together on the novel for a bit um and then she found she found um verso uh, verso books and they've been incredible um i was very lucky to work with them because my um uh, editor andy shao is a um chinese american so that was an, another important thing for me that you know when when someone read my novel, uh, they could see what I was doing and they understood where I was going with it. So all of that, that whole process, I mean, I think to actually just write the novel only took about 
three years, um, mm. I say only, <laughs> it's quite long. But then getting it into print took so much longer, probably four years. Um, there was a delay of about one to one and a half years just um, when the book was supposed to have been published early last year, if I'm not mistaken. So that was almost a, a year and a couple of months. It just takes a long time as well, you know. Um, it, it takes a long time. Um, I, I hope it will be different for, for different generations or the next generation. But it it, it it was a piece of work. Someone said, oh, well, it was like a PhD. So I said, yes, thank you. It was like a PhD. <laughs> um, yeah. All right. Uh, just one more question for you, and um, is that is uh, what what are you working on now, or what is what is next for you? So I have a full time job. I work for um, a group of museums in South Africa. I'm actually um, like the director of advancement. Um, so um, that's my full time job. I am, however, trying to write a novel. It's a little bit hard to find the time to balance all these things. Um, and I'm also a mother and I have two children. So, you know, and I'm a dog owner. Um, so those, those things take up time and it takes up energy, but I am trying to write an, another novel. Um, and yeah, it, it's in its very early stages. I've, I've abandoned a couple of novels as well because yeah, they just haven't, they haven't hit right um, the last couple of years, but I am working on something new. Um, it's not ready to show to anyone. Um, and yeah, that, that's kind of it. That's it for now. Not too many things on the go. How do you manage to put out so many novels, lady? Oh, so I'm, I'm in about five years, six years now. Yeah, I'm very tired all the time. That's <laughs> I'm, yeah. I'm a high functioning, tired person. That's all. You you are very high functioning. <laughs> Um, we did just get one more question. Are there other African writers you'd like to mention who Langston championed? Uh, you spoke about Bessie Head for one. Mm. So, so the the writer that I kind of imagining imagine him having these very intimate conversations with. His name is his name was Richard Grieve, um, and he was from Cape Town. Taught at the school that I would eventually go to. Um, he also uh, kept correspondence with Blok Modestsane, and Blok Modestsane was living in London at the time and was just flat broke, uh, was very depressed. He had to leave South Africa uh, and go into exile because of his politics. And Langston used, just by the way, sent him money, he sent him clothes. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a bit cringy when you read the letters because I actually went and sat and read the letters um, because Blok Modestsane was so poor. Um, you know, stuck in London, he had no clothes somehow, just this, this incredible acts of generosity, which struck me as just really lovely. Um, okay, my internet connection is unstable, I'm sorry. <laughs> you can hear me? Um. So, Have see, I don't know back? if you can. Oh, there you are. There you are again. I'm sorry. Okay. It, it, it's 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 on backup generator. So, <laughs> so um, we almost made it through the whole hour without anything crashing. Um, so, so there was Blog Modisani, there was Bessie Head, there was Phyllis Ntantala, um, also a very important South African black writer. Uh, there were there were so many. I mean, it wasn't just in South Africa because I, I saw someone speaking about. South Africans, you know, thinking we're exceptional. He wrote to African writers on the rest of the continent. Um, so, so the two books, I mean, they, they, I don't know how easy they are to find. I imagine you could probably find them in the USA. So it's an African treasury and uh, I can't, I'm not sure if I remember where the other one, the other one, uh, what the other one is called, but I had it here somewhere the other day. Um, but you know, there are actually academics in the US who, um, I think it's Professor Shane, mm, I want to say Ward, but that might not be correct. And I, if I'm not mistaken, he's at Utah State University. He's written extensively about Langston Hughes' interactions with um, a South African, sorry, it's Shane Graham. He's written extensively about South African writers and their interactions. And oh, that's the name of the book. It's called 
uh, Langston Hughes and the South African drum generation. Uh, drum was a just this incredible uh, subversive, perhaps transgressive, perhaps magazine from the 1950s. Um, and it, it, I mean, it, it showcased photography and South African writing in a way that nothing had done at that point. This was, you know, South Africa had just turned to apartheid. This was the 1950s. So because of Drum Magazine, Langston Hughes came into contact with South African writers. And so uh, Professor Graham at Utah State, um, he, com he, uh, he compiled the letters into a book. Um, but I'm, I'm sure lots of these letters are also in there. Is it Bainaker? Beneka Library uh, at Yale University. Beneka, I'm sorry, I'm not sure how to pronounce it. I'm not either. I think it's, okay. I don't know what it is. <laughs> I know what you mean. I think, yeah, yeah. So, so the way we all Langston Jesus papers are um, kept at the Beneka or the Beneka Library at Yale University. So, yeah. Oh, oh right. they, someone, they, some, someone posted it. Thank you. Um, well, thank you both for this wonderful conversation. Um, if you haven't yet, um, please rush to, to buy this um, and read about everything that you've heard about this afternoon um, and also by uh, Lady's new story collection. Thank you both for joining us. Uh, We've learned so much in this hour. Um, and thanks to all of our audience who's joined us as well. And we'll hopefully we'll see you all again soon. Yeah, thank you. It was wonderful talking to you. Lady, thank you so much. And thank you to the Center for Fiction. The first trip I have to New York, I will, well, maybe not the first, maybe the second. I will certainly <laughs> come, and, come and pop in, I'd love to. It sounds like a wonderful space. So thank you wow. so much, Lady, for your close reading and your generosity. It, it was lovely. I loved it. Thank you. Bye.